Welcome everybody. Again, my name is Christine Biglin. I'm with St. Mary's County Library in Southern Maryland. Um, and tonight I am very honored to have with me Mr. Wayne Carlin. Uh, Wayne has had a distinguished career as a Vietnam veteran, an author, an editor, a writer for radio and film, a film producer, as well as a professor of English and languages at the College of Southern Maryland for over 30 years. Wayne has earned numerous awards, which include Outstanding Novel, Best Feature Film, the Juniper Prize for Fiction, five-time winner of the State of Maryland Individual Artist Award, and the Vietnam Veterans of America Excellence in the Arts Award. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Christine. It's very nice to be here. Uh, so tomorrow is Veterans Day, uh, so I would like to start by thanking you for serving in the Vietnam War and all of our other veterans um, for all of their service. Uh, while you were in Vietnam, you were cited with the Combat Air Crew Badge with three stars, the Air Medal, the Presidential Unit Citation, National Defense Service Medal, and the Vietnam Service Medal. Uh, so thank you again for that and for anyone watching and all the veterans out there. Um, after leaving the service, Wayne, you eventually became involved with writing, radio, and film that centered on the shared experiences around the Vietnam War, so both sides, the American and the Vietnamese. Uh, what led you to get started with this topic? I think one of the um, main things that uh, disturbed me about the war actually was, and, and disturbed me about the, the material that was being written and put on films and so on afterwards, um, was that the Vietnamese were kind of seen as a backdrop for the, for the American experience. Um, and in some ways, a, a, you know, I was disturbed by things that I had seen in Vietnam. I had, uh, it, it's part of my duty I had at the beginning, the first six months I was, I was there. Uh, I was working in a unit that uh, um, had a lot of contacts in the village around the area that we were protecting. And it was my first meeting with the Vietnamese. I, I kind of got close to them. Um, I felt like... You know, I was never, I never saw any real atrocities or anything like that, but I, but I also came to feel that, um, A, that us being there was harming the country much more than it was helping it. And, you know, and I went to Vietnam believing in the cause. Um, I went, I, you know, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I come from a um, family that, that had to flee Europe and that uh, became, you know, the United States became a refuge for us. And I felt like I owed the country. So some of the things that I saw, um, you know, I, I saw great bravery on the on the part of, of my fellow Marines. I saw self-sacrifice and comradeship, but I also saw a kind of brutalization both of the of the Vietnamese and of ourselves. Because when you make somebody less human than you are, which is what happens in a war, uh, you dehumanize yourself as well. So it, it had bothered me, and when I started writing, um, I, I started, you know, one of my books, my first, one of my first books was called Lost Armies, and I decided that I'm writing about uh, veterans. Um, I'm setting it in the area where we live, you know, in Southern Maryland, but I wanted to have a Vietnamese element in, in it, so I did some research, I, and I put in characters who were Vietnamese in the novel because I felt like they'd been left out of all the reading I'd been doing and the films I'd been seeing, except as kind of, you know, stereotypes and, and, and uh, as I said, like a, a backdrop for the American experience. Um, then, you know, I, I wrote a few other books that were published, but in 1993, I was in a program uh, through the Joyner Center at the University of Massachusetts where they brought together uh, American writers like myself who were veterans of the war and Vietnamese writers who had been on the other side, the people we would have killed or they would have killed us, you know, in fairness, who had also become writers after the war. And, you know, we all lived together um, over the summer. You know, we did seminars and presentations and all that and taught classes, but, you know, basically we lived together and I got to know uh, some of them very well, in, in, including a, uh, a young woman writer who had been in the, uh, what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trails during the war. She'd been in the North Vietnamese Army. Her 
unit's job was to um, fill in the bomb craters where we would bomb or to uh, take care of unexploded order, ordnance or to carry the dead and wounded. And, you know, she'd become a pretty well-known writer in Vietnam. And as a result of that friendship with her and a few of the others, we decided we're writers, that the way we communicate with the world is through stories. That, you know, as human beings, what we are, we're made up of our stories. And if I know your story and you know my story, we become human to each other. So the idea of, uh, of our project was to put out a, uh, a book, an anthology, which would include right, you know, American writers, which would include South Vietnamese writers, the writers who would come here as refugees on the, on the losing Vietnamese side of the war, and would include the writers from Vietnam itself as a kind of you know, literary reconciliation. And that came together. And it, it marked my first time going back to Vietnam, actually, to uh, speak with the writers and negotiate the contracts, all, all this kind of thing. Um, so that was, that was a, um, a book that, that, that uh, came out in, in uh, 1995 called The Other Side of Heaven. And it, it did, I mean, it had the writers from the three sides of the war. You know, the people who, who once would have tried to kill each other now sharing stories with the public. And it, and it had a, f a fairly big impact. And that led into other types of projects like that. Um, I became a, a kind of pro, pro bono editor at the uh, at Curbstone Press, which was the press that put out that anthology uh, for Vietnamese work that we translate and publish in, in the United States. And also because of the context in Vietnam, we had American uh, writers and stories being published in Vietnam, which is which is still going on. So that's that that's what led into it. Um, I can. I, I think you probably asked me a little bit later about um, Wandering Souls because I, I, I don't want to talk too much about, you know, let me, let me give you some space to ask questions. In other words. <laughs> no, you're, you're doing fine. So, so it, it sounds like it all started from that, that kind of shared experience at the college where yeah. you got to know like a few people personally yeah. and then so much expanded from that. Yeah. It, okay, so it seems like, you know, okay, I, I was going to ask you, like, how you found representation for the the Vietnamese point of view, but it looks mm -hmm. like it kind of grew organically from... Well, but I'll, I'll tell you, though, uh, when I had the idea for, the, when we had the idea for the, the anthology, uh, at that time I was being published by, um, you know, one of the major American publishers. I'd, I'd had three novels out, you know, at, at that point, and I, I went, you know, through my agent, to them asking with a concept for the book and they said no nah. and then my agent took it around to a lot of the other mainstream publishers and they all said nah. you know, we, we, we're not going to do that you know we can't see that that's commercially viable um until it was, it was picked up by uh, curbstone press which is uh, in the you know an in a small independent press um and it it worked out of i guess i should say this too it worked out of uh uh connecticut Willimantic, Connecticut, um, and that, when I'd come back from the war, um, one of the things that I got involved in was, I, you know, at, at that point, like a lot of Vietnam veterans writing, we could not get our stuff published. And finally, mm -hmm. we came together and we formed something called, called First Casualty Press um, from Aeschylus in War, Truth is the First Casualty. And we, and we did three volumes of, of writings by Vietnam veterans, a, a volume of poetry, a volume of short fiction called Free Fire Zone, where I was the you know, main editor, and then another, another uh, volume of fiction and poetry. So that was uh, Curbstone, where I brought the proposal for the Vietnamese American anthology was about you know, four miles from where we had done First Casualty Press and the first anthology of Vietnam veterans uh, writing that, that it was published in the United States. And by the way, that, that, though, that book, uh, particularly the, the poetry, it made a big impact when it came out. Um, so much so that McGraw-Hill asked to come in as a partner in, you know, in publishing the books, which we, we did. We worked as a kind of independently, but in partnership with, with McGraw-Hill. And a lot of the people who became the 
you know, Vietnam veteran writers that, that you know, are now out uh, were, were involved in that, in that project. So sorry, but that's how, um, that's how I, I ended up getting the representation for the Vietnamese work here through, through Curbstone Press because they were, because uh, they, were, they were intelligent, daring, innovative, and had heart. That's a little advice to um, people who are trying to get published. Like you, you have to persevere and, yeah. you know, maybe pitch your ideas many times to different people until it catches different, on. To different people, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, good, good job sticking with it because it, it really paid off. So, so it sounds like McGraw-Hill finally came in once, once you got to try it out a little bit and they, they could see yeah. that it was successful. Well, that what yeah, but not with the uh, Vietnamese, not with not with the other side of heaven. That's with the um, the first Vietnam veterans works. Other side of heaven was totally with Curbstone Press. And, oh, okay. And Curbstone Press, then at that point we started uh, what we call the Voices from Vietnam series, where I co-edited with you know myself and then uh, two writers in Vietnam, Le Minh Quê, who was the woman I was talking about, and Hoang Tai two well-known known writers in Vietnam. And then we had a, uh, a man named Trung Sun who was on the uh, refugee on the other side, the Viet other Vietnamese side of the war, um, who had come here as a boat person and as a literary scholar and literally a rocket scientist who worked at NASA. Wow. Um, and so we, you know, so we had those kind of joint editorship. And, you know, it was about reconciliation. It wasn't about, it wasn't about, um, the politics of the situation. It was about here. Here's our stories. You know, here's here's what here's what we, what we are as human beings. And if you know those stories, then that's going to make it harder to kill or to go to war. That that seems to be a theme through a lot of your things: the the reconciliation and the humanizing of mm -hmm. the other side. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. So so you had mentioned that you were taking on more of an editing role um, when you were with Curbstone Press. So, so how did that differ for you from being the author of your own books? Well, I, I didn't stop being the author of my own books at that time. Um, but the, the editing was, the process of editing, uh, I, I'm sometimes called a, uh, a translator, and I'm not, because my Vietnamese is, is not you know, really good enough. Uh, but the way the, the way this would work would be when I'd get the work from Vietnam, it would be translated uh, it, to, in various degrees of English. Uh, OK, and and it was my job to adapt it into, um, you know, into not not only readable English, but actually uh, to ke keep the spirit of the story, you know, to keep mm -hmm. the spirit of the novel. Um, as, as it had been published in, in Vietnam for that readership. So I'd work, it'd always be a co-work with the author and, and with a, you know, a, a, somebody who was a fluent Vietnamese translator and then me you know, doing the final project and everybody approving it along the way. So that was, that was the type of editing that I was, I was doing with, uh, with Curbstone. And it's, it's challenging. I mean, sometimes, sometimes the English translations were fairly smooth and good. Sometimes they were in what what one of one of the uh, translators I worked with said she uh, she spoke Vietli, Vietlish, <laughs> and that, that's kind of what the you know the, the stories came out in, and there's you know also the idea of of you know concepts and slang and so on that you know might mean one thing in Vietnamese and had to be you know, how do you, how do you get that concept across so it so it keeps the spirit of the story. And you know, those are the challenges in that in that kind of editing. So, at what point did you become an English professor? Uh, uh, well, that's 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 a kind of a long long story. Also, I I, I mean, I worked uh, after the war in in various things. I I also um, got my degree and then worked as a um, journalist as a writer. Um, in Israel during the 73 war and for about a four year period, you know, before and after that. Um, met my wife at, at, at that time. Um, when we came back to the States 
this was like in the in the mid 70s when we came back to the states um i was i was trying to finish my first novel and working any job i could and then i i picked up a job teaching at uh, montgomery college in rockville teaching english and then my first book was first novel and the first book my first novel was published and i uh, got a job teaching at the college of southern maryland at that at that point they were looking for um, they were looking for an English professor or an English instructor at that, at that time. And they were looking for somebody actually to um, supervise and open up the English department at the uh, St. Mary's campus, which was a very small you know, building at that time. So I, I was hi hired to do that. And my wife and I came down here. And then from that point on, I, I taught at the at College of Southern Maryland and you know, became a professor, et cetera. So you were doing all like a lot of these things um, simultaneously, it seems. Oh like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah have, you know, having to you know like make a living and <laughs> pay, pay, <laughs> pay the pay the mortgage and you know raise raise a, raise our son and you know et, et cetera. My wife worked also as a counselor uh, for abused girls at the, the Walden Sierra House program in, in St. Mary's. Oh, yeah, for about twenty years. Oh, that's that's great work, also. It was, and some of her stories ended up in my stories too. Yes, that was I, behind me on the shelf. I have um, your four fiction books that um, have some some relation to Vietnam, like with characters or a backdrop. And as you said that, it reminded me of one of these because of of one of the characters in there. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. So you write what you know, right? In what I can imagine, you know, I've done historical novels because, and I never lived in 1814. True. I promise, True. even though I am, you know, getting more and more decrepit looking. But you know, it's it's um, yeah, it's what I what I can research, what I can imagine, and what I know. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think that what I know can art for writers uh, can sometimes be too limiting. Because what you know is also what you can imagine and what you can find out. And that's part of your base of knowledge also. Um, you, you had mentioned, so I want to bring up your book, Wandering Souls, which yeah. says journeys with the dead and the living in Vietnam. This is your work of nonfiction. Um, and that is an account of two soldiers who met face to face on the battlefield in Vietnam with one killing the other. The survivor of that encounter later went on to learn about who his enemy was as a person um, and then come to terms with the experience, which yeah. we had talked about. You have that theme of reconciliation and it it really comes out in this book. Um, so how how can a story like this help other veterans? Well, uh, in the same way that it helped the veteran who was well the veterans who were involved because it was uh, Homer Steadley who was who was the man um, who wanted to wanted to return the notebooks that he had taken from the body of the North Vietnamese soldier that he had shot back to that man's family and to myself and to the other veterans that went along uh, on the two trips we took to Vietnam with that um, with that mission okay so I, I I should say that, you know, I'll just give you a little more context in that. I mean, uh, um, Homer Steadley was a lieutenant in the 4th Infantry Division fighting in the Central Highlands. He uh, uh, had come face to face on a jungle trail with a man named Huan Yak Nam, who was a medic in the North Vietnamese Army. Uh, Homer didn't know he was a medic, wouldn't have made any difference at the time. Basically, Homer got his weapon around more quickly than Dom did and, and killed him. And he had been in the war, Homer had been in the war for a time, you know, he'd, he'd been involved in killing other people, but not face to face. So there was something in looking into that man's eyes and something in when he saw the, the journals that were on the body, they were filled with this meticulous writing and notes and drawings and so on. And, you know, Dom, bec he became a human being rather than a target. You know, he, in other words, Homer saw Dom's story, that this is a person. So, and, and when he came back from the war, I mean, he suffered 
suffered from 40 years of PTSD um, for, you know, not, not only for that incident, but for many things he had gone through in the war. And his wife, who was also the, uh, the daughter of other veterans who'd gone through PTSD in the Second World War, you know, finally told him, you know, you should deal with this. And the way you should deal with this is, you know, he put a lot of that out of his mind. So he went to the attic where his letters, he'd sent letters to his mother to reconstruct his period in Vietnam to try to deal with it. And he came across those notebooks, which he put completely out of his mind. And, and so he knew that I was involved with this reconciliations effort. So he asked me to, um, can you find a family? Can we, can we return these notebooks to the family? And to, you know, make it short, we did, and it was the the process that we went through because we not only found the family, and then I was able to first bring the notebooks back because Homer couldn't bring himself to do it at first, and it came back to a a family had who had lost other people in the war to a village where they had lost two hundred young men to the war where over 140 were still missing in action. So they had not, not known what had happened to this man that, that Homer had killed. And this brought them a kind of peace and they welcomed us, you know, like we were long lost brothers, the American veterans that came with the, with the documents. And it was just amazing. And then when, when Homer saw that, um, a few years later, we, I went back with him to that village. And at that point, you know, we met the family, but we also traveled with them to the place where Dom had been buried to try to identify the remains and bring them back to the village. And again, it's very involved. It's, it's what the book's about, but we did. Okay, we brought them back and then they were buried, you know, in the village cemetery and, and identified. That process is what veterans need to go through. You know, not... You know, not that the details of that, but the idea that if you if you have any kind of trauma, you have to bring it out. You have to unbury it. You know, which is what we did. With, we literally unburied that that body. But Homer unburied it from himself and telling the story and, and thinking about it, trying to deal with it. You know, and then once you've unburied it, you can you can mourn it. You know, you and you can also make it into something good. You know, return making. Bringing peace to that family was something that was, you know, redemptive, both for the family and for Homer. And then it can be buried again, you know, with, in, in, and mourned in peace, you know. And, and that's the process that uh, anybody suffering from PTSD has to go through, that unburying and that mourning and that trying to make it into something good. And then, then, you, then, you, then you can be at peace with it. Yeah, it's nice to have a book like that to sort of, you know, walk with the person if that's your experience, like, you know, so you see you're not doing it all by yourself. So I think that's great that you offer that through your work. Um, okay, let's say we're talking, in, in addition to editing, um, you were also a writer and producer for the radio program, Shared Weight which was syndicated on National Public Radio. Um, what was that program about and what was it like writing for radio in particular? Okay. Well, there was a series of programs, uh, Mark Steiner, who uh, was a radio program in, in Baltimore, uh, did a, it, because it was coming on the um, 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. And Mark's idea was to bring, um, bring a number of Vietnam veterans you know, back to, to Vietnam and um, to include himself and, and you know, he'd been an, an anti-war protester and to meet with the Vietnamese and so on. So uh, one program of that was Wandering Souls. So it was, it was um, what, uh, there was a lot of interrelationship between the radio program. We did per two programs with that. The first time we went with Mark is when I brought the, uh, uh, the documents back to the village. Right. And then wrote, wrote about that. And then this, the next time when we went back with Homer. But in addition to uh, 
in addition to that, we also went back with a, an African-American veteran from Baltimore who uh, also suffered from PTSD and drug addiction. And he, he had started a psychological counseling program in, in Baltimore uh, with, an, with another friend of mine who was a medic in Vietnam. Um, and, you know, and with, with the wives of people also. So to meet with the Vietnamese and so on. So there's a series of programs about, um, about the Wandering Souls episode, but also about these other veterans uh, going, going back to Vietnam and uh, meeting with the Vietnamese and you know, their experiences and what they went through. So the writing, um, I, I had done some screenwriting, but you know, it was because we had, um, we recorded everything. So for one thing, you know, I was able to listen to recordings while, you know, while writing scripts. And then it was, it was a matter of a very collaborative, of sitting, with, sitting with Mark and thinking, you know, what would be the, what would be, how should we start this? You know, what's the hook we're going to get people in? And then what, what's the sequence of events? And then, um, you know, we worked with a, with a music producer also. I mean, what's the music that we can use between these sequ uh, sequences? So it's it's that immediate thing that you're you're writing for an immediate audience. Uh, it's not the it's not it wasn't the solitary solitariness is that a word I don't know of writing of sure. writing you know of writing a book you know being in, in isolation and, and being being in complete control and it's also you know you have to you have to rely more on dialogue than on description. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's radio so you can't it's you know it's not film you're not showing the, the description but you you know have to mainly rely on dialogue and write dialogue or you know or transcribe dialogue in the right you know right sequences and so on. So it's, it was interesting. I like the writing. That's good. And you did some film also. Yeah, yeah. I was uh what, what the uh I, I I got involved with a Vietnamese film that you know it was, it was like one of the first Vietnamese films where they're using American characters. So the, and the uh, producer and the director were two young people, husband and wife, young young Vietnamese people, and they and they were the, the son and daughter-in-law of one of the uh, uh, women that I'd worked with on the um, on the Voices from Vietnam series. So I was in their house one day, and they were in in Hanoi, and they were talking about making this film. And they said we really want an American viewpoint in the film. You know, it's going to be it's going to be about these Vietnamese veterans and back into their war and everything, uh, but we want an American viewpoint. We want an American character and an American viewpoint also. So they asked me to, um, you know, both write that part of the script, but also to be there for the filming and you know be a consultant for for the American part of the film, which uh, which was interesting uh, because we ended up we want we wanted to use extras. There were, a lot, there were a lot of Marines from the embassy actually who volunteered to be extras in the film. Ah. But yeah, but then the embassy said, no, you can't do it. Or the Marine Corps said, you can't do it. So, ah. so we ended up, most of our Americans were actually Russian students in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but they had all, all the, you know, they had all the uniforms and equipment and vehicles and weapons and so on because we had left all that stuff. You know, after, oh. after the war, you know, so these, these, you know, Russians look very authentic. I mean, they, they were using, um, you know, like abandoned American rifles, helmets, flag jackets. Oh. Six by trucks, M60 machine guns. We had, we had everything and uh, we were able to use it in the film. How, how far after the end of the war was this film made? 2002. Oh, so pretty far afterwards. Oh yeah. Oh. yeah, it wouldn't have been made otherwise. Yeah, yeah. it would not. It, you you could not show sympathetic American characters in you know in Vietnamese literature or, or film until I'd say about it started changing about the mid '80s when uh, Vietnam opened up and uh, what they called renovation. Doi Moi is a period where they started to allow more. Uh, uh, the economy went more capitalist and they started to allow more uh, there, you know, well, things that were forbidden before in, in writing and film were permitted. And that would go up and down, but that 
you know, I'd say from the mid eighties on that, that started to change. Ah, uh, yes. Cause just like we had sort of a negative stereotype of them, they had one going the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, all, we all dehumanize each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Yes. Okay. So the American, well, this was weird. I'll add one more thing. The American character in the film was a guy who had, who took the diary off a North Vietnamese soldier and wanted to bring it back. And this happened before Homer, before Home, Wandering Souls. Oh. You know, and there were a lot of strange things that happened with Wandering Souls. You know, I, I, you know, I'll tell you, but, um, one of the things was the, the, the mother of the uh, director and producer, you know, she was the journalist that I sent Homer's, um, you know, the, the, the scan of the documents. I sent them to her and she published it in the newspaper. And, and I, you know, I told her, look, we got it. We have, we have an obligation to do this. You know, we did this movie <laughs> and, you know, and we have an obligation to find his family. It's the same the same story, and is her articles that the that the family found, and that's how they discovered um, that Homer had the had the uh, notebooks from from Dom's body. So wow! It was, all, it was all all connected and connected. Also, I, I I'll tell you one other strange thing uh, out of Maine that ha happened um, when we were coming back with Dom's remains which we were, uh, this had happened in uh, Pleiku in the Central Highlands of Vietnam. And we were asked to do a, um, we had had the remains, they were just the clean bones basically in a, in a nondescript box. And the family said, we need to stop somewhere along the side of the road here. There's a, there's a um, road that goes through the Ma uh, Mavang Pass in, in um, in the Central Highlands, and you know, we need to stop, and we need to we need to thank the, the you know whatever the spirits of the of the forest and the and the rivers and and, and the sky that have allowed us to you know recover this this body. So we stopped at the side of the road just arbitrarily at this place, and um, they set up the box and in, they burn incense and they put out some of Dom's favorite things, you know, it's a bottle of whiskey and some chocolate and some cigarette, you know, stuff like that. I mean, you know, everyday things, you know, and then, and, and Homer, of course, was very affected, you know, I mean, everybody was crying, but he was really, he kept looking around and muttering, you know, and, and then I asked, you know, he said, we fought here, we fought here, you know, and, and so later I asked him, um, I, you know, I know you fought in that area, but was that something special? And he said, you don't understand. I mean, that was, that was the base of the hill where I killed him. That spot, you know, that that, uh, so that we just, you know, arbitrarily picked like that. So, wow, stuff, stuff happens, you know. Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's sounds like it was quite an experience for everybody. Um. Okay. What What would you say? your most valuable lessons are that you've learned from doing this very broad examination of the shared experiences of the Vietnam War? Uh, I, I think I, I probably already spoke about it when I say that, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, war is a terrible thing. And if, and if you feel in particular that it's um, something we get into too quickly and often unnecessarily, you know, which is which is my viewpoint. You can agree with that or not? Um, that one of the things that that can prevent it, and one of the things that can just make us good human beings, you know, a relationship with other human beings, whether whether it's a war situation or not, is is to know the the complexities of their lives through their stories. And when you see the stories, you know, my friend Lucy. Cecil Clifton, the poet, would always say that, you know, good literature, it's a, it's a window and a mirror. You know, mm -hmm. you, when, you, when you know their story, it, it's a mirror because you find yourself. There's a commonality. This is the, you, you know, you're feeling about the world and, and love and hate and, you know, children and, what, you know, whatever it is. You're feeling it's the same way I, I feel. 
it's also a window because you know you're looking at things that are that are not like your experience. You're looking into a different culture or, or a different humanity, whatever it is, and you and you're learning to respect that because of because you know it's it's different, but it's it's what it is, and it's and the mirror is there too, so you can see you can see you know if if I if I had you know there's a story by Tim O'Brien called The Man I Killed in which he looks at the body of a, of a dead Viet Cong soldier and he imagines that person's life. You know, and he imagines him being somebody who'd been a university student and reluctant to be drafted and had a girlfriend and, you know, and, and, and all this stuff. And in, in, imagine, in imagining that person's life, he goes from being a, a enemy, a lifeless corpse, into a reflection of, you know, of Tim O'Brien thinking, if I had been born in Vietnam, this is who I could have been, you know, if I had been born in, you know, wherever you want to think of, you know, it's not, again, it's not necessarily a war, you know, that, that imagining the lives of other people, that the empathy that can come from that, I think is, I think is essential to us as, as human beings and all the ways that we can, you know, screw up other human beings and ourselves. Yeah. You're, you're right. Empathy is essential. And um, I think it's great that you have found so many different ways to, you know, pull good things out of a difficult situation. Thank you. Um, I think I would probably like, have, having been able to take one of your classes, Wayne, you say you, you have a great perspective. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, re I'm retired, but I still teach one or two classes every now and then. Yeah. And, love, and you share I your. Love I love interacting with students. Yeah. Um, oh, so it, not all of your work has exclusively centered about Vietnam. So I just want to mention um, a couple other things. Uh, you have some historical fiction books. Uh, this is called "Wished for a Country," um, and seeing as I've lived in St. Mary's County uh, for about twenty years now, I really appreciate. This one, which is about the um, original European settlers coming over, uh, Father Andrew White, you have excerpts from his diary and uh, talks about the Native American population. And this one, which I really enjoyed, A Wolf by the Ears, this one just came out last year, um, also in St. Mary's County, and it's centered around the War of 1812. Right. So what, what inspired you to write these historical fictions that are um, taking place in St. Mary's County? Well, living in St. Mary's County, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fertile ground for history, yeah, you know, and, and I mean, uh, as I, I was lucked out coming here, getting that job and then coming here and, and being a writer, you know, I just got um, very, very interested in, in the area uh, because you can see so much of the history here in, in the topography and, and, in, and in the people, uh, but also in the way that it's, it's a microcosm of, um, you know, America in so many ways, and all the tensions in America, and where all of those tensions started, you know, our relationships with the with the Native Americans, our relationships between um, you know, black and white, the, the issue of slavery, um, how that how that played out here. So 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 much of this the state itself, but particularly this area of the state is a kind of a microcosm of, of, the, of the country. Everything that we went through in our, in our history, all the tensions and all of the ways that we, um, you know, that, that we need to heal from, you know, mm -hmm. make, and, make, and make something better and live up to our ideal of what we're supposed to be as Americans. You know, that's, we, we, we see that here. Uh, for for, the la for uh, A Wolf by the Years, um, I was inspired uh, directly. There's a book um, by, excuse me a second, there's a book by, I want to make sure I get the right title. Um, yeah, by uh, Al Taylor called Internal Enemy. And it was, and it was about the situation where uh, African-American slaves during the War of 1812 were promised freedom by the British mm -hmm. if they went over and fought for the British. And it, it struck me, I mean, the book really fascinated me and a lot of it was set in Southern Maryland and Northern Virginia, Tidewater area, right? And, and it really fascinated me, you know, also because that dilemma in American history is, is so vivid in that, in that contrast that on one hand, you know, we think of 
the War of 1812 and our usual history that we get of it, you know, we're fighting, you know, again, we're fighting the British for freedom. You know, but here's a portion of our population that's not free. And so by joining the British, they're fighting for freedom. So it's this, it's this two, um, you know, two ideas of America and freedom and what they, and, and what they should be that, that come out into that, into that dichotomy, into that conflict where these people who are Americans have to fight against other Americans in order, in order to be free. And mm -hmm. that, that, that issue that still divides us, that led finally to the Civil War and that you know led to all of the problems we're still dealing with because of because of race in this country that, that all starts in 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 situations like that and then yeah it's happening in my backyard so you're damn right i'm going to write about it so. yeah and uh yeah it inspired me I, I i had to go down to the leonardtown wharf and read the uh, historical marker down there when i got to the part of the book where um the british were invading leonardtown which yeah, is yeah. where I live. This is where the library is. <laughs> so it's um. It's yeah, I found a uh, yeah, St. Mary's College put up a uh, uh, installation art. It's a, it's like a, a mirrored slave cabin, um, off of of Mattapani Road, with with uh, little uh, excerpts from from um, written things written by enslaved people at that time and and by owners and so on. And uh, you know, creates a mirrored effect. But but the other strange thing was that this is about half a mile from my house. And then it turns out that the family they found that actually lived where that installation is put was a, a, an enslaved family that had, its members had gone to fight for the British during the War of 1812, mm. uh, which I didn't know, you know, that, ticket, that it, well, that area hadn't been, uh, you know, dug up at the time I was writing, writing a novel. So, um, and then they, whoever picked, the, um, the the script that went on the installation, they, they mentioned my three main characters. You know, right, didn't, right in a row. They didn't read, they didn't read the book. You know, but they mentioned my three main characters. Here's, come Sarah, come come you know come, come Jacob, come you know Tower Hill. Come Tower Hill, you know, which is an unusual name anyway. And then mm -hmm. you know, so I, uh, yeah, there's I don't know. Sometimes. Sometimes you write stuff and magical things just happen. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, stranger than fiction, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have a new book that's that's due out soon called What Their Fathers Never Told Them. Oh, no, it's not, it's not due out soon. I'm, I'm still shopping it around. Actually. Oh, 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 I didn't know what yeah, the there, there, been, there have been parts, parts of it have been published and parts of it um, are going to be published in a uh, Knopf anthology, but the but the whole book itself, I still don't have a publisher for. Oh, oh, what's it, was, it about? The, the manuscript uh, got the uh, Penn Bellwether Beth, Penn Bellwether. It was a uh, you know runner up for that for that prize, but uh, it's it's about um, it's about veterans, but the veterans of the present wars. Uh, oh. uh, uh, you know about uh, um, Afghan and Iraq veterans uh, whose fathers were in the Vietnam War. So oh. it's a, it's about that situation. And it's a, and it's about that trauma and the issue of veterans suicide and the issue of you know war trauma being carried from generation to generation. And it's wow. also it's also set in in Southern Maryland and. It was inspired because uh, at, at, at the college, at College of Southern Maryland, I had a lot of students who were veterans coming back from um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, when I started out after, after uh, I got out of the Marine Corps after the Vietnam War, I started out in a community college in the same way. And I'm, and I'm dealing with these students who were going through the same things I had gone through mm -hmm. you know, that many years ago. Um, and, and some of them were um well some of them were very traumatized some of them not so much but they but it, it was it just it, it just really saddened and, and also enraged me you know another generation was going through this and uh, so that was that's what the book is about and it's called what their fathers never told them mm. which is sums up a lot of it 
All right. That is, that's hard. It's frustrating to keep seeing the new things happen, but uh, keep, keep working toward the good and it gets there. Um, oh, so yeah, speaking of writing books, uh, November is National Novel Writing Month. Um, and seeing as you're an author and a longtime professor of creative writing, um, is there is there a single piece of advice that you can offer to aspiring authors, or is it not a is there not a single thing out there that you can across the board? The most most important thing is read. Read ah. everything. Read other writers. You know, I learned I learned to write by reading. I learned to write by by reading the the, the authors who move me. And you know, in in, what, in some way, small or large, change my picture of the world. And, and asking myself, how did they do it? You know, read, reading as a reader and just getting the experience of, of the reading, but also reading as a writer where you are, uh, you're, you know, you're questioning, I re that was strong. I really, that, that really moved me. How did that writer do that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the best teacher any writer can have is to read, 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 read as much as you can. So you'd, you'd recommend visiting your local library? <laughs> There's a, there's a there's a there's a uh, little message from the library. Visit your library. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm completely on board with that message. Right? <laughs> uh, okay, that is all of the questions that I have. Um, if anybody who's watching would like to um, unmute themselves or type something in the chat, we have open time. Um, so you can. Oh. Can, I, can I ask a question? Of course. All right. Hi, Neil. Hey, Wayne. Hi. Um, so Wayne and I have been friends and colleagues for, for many, many years. And yesterday, we had a discussion with a, a Vietnamese writer, Quay Mai. And um, at one point, and I don't know how it came up, but Wayne, I, I would like for you to go back over um, the thank you for your service. Um, you know, it, it, like what, what, what does that do? Mm -hmm. um, because I thought, I thought it was very poignant yesterday when, when you had, when you talked about it. Well, it's, I, I think, as I, as I said, Neil, that, that thank you for your service, the phrase came about, I think, starting with the, uh, the first goal, goal for, you know, when, when people felt badly about the way Vietnam veterans had been treated. And, you know, this, this phrase started going around. I think, I think for a lot of us, um, the, the problem with it is that for many people, it, it serves us all that they need to do. All right. Now I've said thank you for your service, and now I can feel good about myself. And and uh, uh, you know, don't don't tell me anything about your service. Um, don't tell me anything about the war. Don't um, you know? Actually, go beyond. You know, now, now I thank you. So so kind of you know, go go on your way, and I'll go on my way, and that and that's all we have to do. And you know, I know that's not fair to everybody who says that. You know, but I think it. But I think it's a Fair picture of, of our of our society as, as a whole, you know, in the way that we deal with veterans. It's you know the the present wars that we've been in have been fought by less than one percent of the population because we have a volunteer armed forces now. You know, an area like we live in Southern Maryland, it's probably more of a population than it is in the rest of the country. But there's that gap in experience between uh, veterans and, and other Americans. And, you know, veterans feel that. I mean, they feel like uh, they're, they're behind a wall. They're, they're on the other side. So to, to hear that without any genuine interest, without, you know, as, as just as kind of a lip service. Um, and the way, that the, the way that the country has dealt with that, you know, to pretty much ignore veterans, to underfund programs that veterans need, to you know not well. 
I, I can't say not deal because there are efforts, but it's just not enough. I mean, the 22 veterans a day are still committing suicide is a fact that we should not live with. You know, who thanked, you know, did somebody thank them for their service and then they, you know, you know went out and killed themselves? I, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's just sticks in my, my craw, I guess. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday that on, on days like this, you know, today is uh, Marine Corps birthday also. Uh, tomorrow's Veterans Day. I, I think about, um, you know, what, what, what does it mean to say thank you for your service? And I think about uh, Jim Childers, who's a friend of mine who was killed on a, on a mission. He switched with me on, you know, on the very last three days of, the, of, of his tour of duty in the war. You know, gone at 19. He never had the chance to do all the things that I did in my life as as is true of all the casualties. And I don't know, I, I, I can't thank Jim Chillers enough, you know, for his, for his service. And I can't thank, I'm sorry, I'm starting to, I'm starting to uh, ramble a little bit because um, it is, it is a sort of trigger for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I, it's, it's, if it's only said as a hollow phrase and you don't want to know anything else, and you don't want to connect in any other way. And if you as a country and as, and as a government don't want to take any more responsibility than saying, thank you, aren't you great? Um, then, then, it, then, it's, that's, then it's just worse than meaningless. It's an insult. Mm. Well, that was one of the first things I said when I started this program, Wayne. Does it, does it- you're, it, you're engaging. You know, it's not a, it's not a hollow, it's not a, you know, just a statement. And then, and then, uh, you know, you go out and, and we don't connect. But what I'm wondering is seeing as that phrase sort of is a trigger for you because of all of that other stuff that goes with it. Is it, is it better for people to just not say that? Do you I, think? You know, people can say anything they want to me. It's just, you know. Um, depending, depending on, on it, it, it's not so much the individuals. Again, it's the, it's the way that our country is dealing with veterans. Mm -hmm. you know, for, me, for me, that phrase is a, is a kind of a, a, a symbol of uh, dealing with, with the style and not the substance. You know, just. So it's maybe almost dismissive. It's, 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 it is dismissive. And dismissive not only in the fact of providing services for veterans and psychological counseling and you know and, and all the other things that, that they need, but also in doing a sincere examination of why we get into wars in the first place. Mm -hmm. And whether they are, you know, whether a particular war, I, you know, I'm not a pacifist. I think there are times we, you know, we probably have to go to war, like the Second World War. But I but I think we need a much more serious examination of you know, when we should get into a war mm -hmm. and then how, how we fight it. So it's not, a, it, you know, thank you for your service. Country, the United States, let's all look at this, you know, a little more, more deeper than that. Yeah, Neil, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of times when you're outside of any particular situation, you don't, you know, you don't even recognize how what you say or do can, can affect the people who are you know, kind of more central to it. So, so I I've, ne it. I've never been to war, nor would I ever want to go to war. Mm -hmm. But um, I've learned more from Wayne's experience and and, and working with veterans at, at the College of Southern Maryland um, about the human toll that it takes on people and you know it's veterans day and you go well okay um what are we celebrating mm -hmm. like what specifically are we celebrating on veterans day the fact that we like when so we, we world war ii korea vietnam Afghanistan, Iraq, like what is it 
exactly we're celebrating as a, as a country. And I'm not sure if it's kind of like a funeral. I tell my students all the time, who is a funeral for? It's not, it's not for the person who's passed away. It's for the people who want to be um, either reminded of their life or celebrate the life that they still have to live. So what is it that we're celebrating? I'll, I'll throw that to you, Wayne. Well, I don't know, Neil, if, um, you know, what we're, what we're officially celebrating on, on Veterans Day is, or, or, the, or the fact that people um, put their lives on their line for their country. All the other questions that you mentioned and, and that I mentioned, uh, you know, go, go along with that. You put your life on line for your country. Um, has your country appreciated that in the sense, not just of saying, you know, thank you, but in, in, in what, was, what was provided when you returned? Has your country, you know, more importantly, appreciated that in uh, the care it takes in deciding whether or not to go to a war? Has your country, well, all, all of that. I, I, I think I tried to cover that in what, in what I was saying about uh, thank you for your service. Yeah. So, yeah, I think about, for me, Veterans Day is there's, there's friends of mine that I have who, who had served and they're very dear to me. And I, you know, I'm, and I'm thankful for them. And we all need to, we all need to maybe do a program through the library that talks about veterans and veterans. Yeah, you know, all, all of this is significant. <clears throat> okay, well. Anybody else have a question? What? Oh, if anybody else has a question. Oh, oh. I was taking your moderators. So. Yeah, that was what I was about to say. All right. <laughs> so. Okay, well. Well, thank you all for being here. And. Uh, oh, thank you, Wayne. I have really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you have had such a great career and uh, you pulled great things out and, you know, put them out there in a way that other people can really get a lot out of them. So I appreciate all of that. So thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight. And I hope you have a good evening. Can I say one more, one more thing? Oh, sure. All right. I'm sorry to take up the space here, but um, oh, no. what... Wayne as a teacher, okay, passing on his, his wisdom to students over all the years that he has, and he continues to do so, um, you know, beyond the books, beyond the, the experience in Vietnam, and, and beyond peace and reconciliation, he's a damn good teacher. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I know that. That's I all I have to that. say. And thank you, Neil. I, yeah, I, I love I love teaching. Yeah, so it's been a gift. You've been able to share that for for so long, it's and continue to. It's been a gift. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, last last call for comments. I want to write at 7.30. I'm, I'm pretty happy with myself when I fit it right in exactly. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all again, and um, especially you, Wayne, for, for being willing to share. I appreciate thank it. And thank you, Christine, for doing programs like this and, and, for, and for the library. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's such a, that's such a valuable um, center for our, our community and never gets all the credit that it should. And, um, I, I know, you know, I talked about read, read, read. Yeah, it's, it's true. I would have never had the reading experience I had, you know, from, from being a kid on without, without the public library. 
Um, it's, it's one of the great American institutions and everybody should support it. Right. And, yes. and love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank I completely you. agree. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for your service in that way. Oh. <laughs> and I will take that in the spirit that it was meant way. Okay. Good night to all of you.